Emergence of Warrior Organization We all know that warrior organization is prevalent before. Um, the purpose of warrior organization is to maintain the peace and order and protects from any invaders, most especially during trading. Before, trading is the common thing uh, to exchange goods and services. Uh, the warriors are often the frontliners. Not only they protect, the organization also have seized territory for expansion. The warrior mi mindset, uh, quote unquote, you won't quit. Instead, you will do whatever it takes to win a fight or complete a mission. So it simply means that they are willing to invest most of their time and understand what it takes to be a leader. They also have hard traits that includes strength, confidence, discipline, aggressiveness, active, and bravery. They say uh, civilizations are built on bones and it's essential to wage a war in order to achieve peace. In such uh, situations, it is the warriors who come to the rescue. Even today, we have uh, someone who protect us, which is our family. Uh, they will rescue us in any way possible to avoid being harmed with someone else. Not only that, there are seven greatest warriors that the world has ever seen. We have Alexander the Great, Spartacus, Ashoka, Julius Caesar, Maharana Pratap, Gretchen the Lionheart, and of course, Leonidas of Sparta. And at this moment, we will focus on Sap and Desert People who was once a warrior. And let's proceed to the next slide. We have home and culture of steep, step and desert people. The physical features of steps are not one vast expanse of uniform grassland. They are dotted with fertile farming areas, often in the banks of large rivers, the shores of lakes, or in oases in desert regions. Here, Villages, towns, and even famous cities such as the fabled Samarkand could grow up, which function as nodes in long-distance trade networks. Interesting facts about steppe and desert people is that steppe is a dry grassy plain that lies between the polar and tropic regions, while deserts for form due to the low level of rainfall, that covers about 20% of the earth. Culture of steppe and desert people is that the warriors of the steppe were unstoppable force. Their dominance ended from a lack of centralized governance and their inability to settle down. This can be attributed in large part to their shared experiences rooted in a heritage of pastoralism and nomadism. They were expert on the horse and could handle a ball, riding at full gallop with ease. Mobility and step uh, tactics ensured that they would exhaust their opponents before they would engage, uh, preferring them to pick off from afar with shower of arrows. Historically, the thinly scattered population lived in small nomadic groups, herding cattle and sheep across the vast steppes. Their settlements were tented encampments which they moved from time to time as their herds moved on. Um, the grassy steppe is the perfect environment in which to raise animals. And one of the Mongolia's main industries is still herding or raising animals. So these animals like cattle, goats, and horses are used for meat, milk, and um, wool products like cashmere. So take note no, that there are three characteristics of the nomads of the steppes. Uh, like they, firstly, they herded or domesticated animals. Uh, th second, they formed clans which groups of people that have common ancestor. And lastly, they sometimes attack villages to expand their territories. So that are the three characteristics of the nomads of the steppes. 
So let's move on to the third slide, uh, which is the military advantage of the steppe people. Uh, the military advantages of the nomadism, which became apparent even before the speed and strength of horses and have been fully harnessed for military purposes. So uh, the greatest cavalry force in the medieval period was not the knight, but the steppe warrior. Uh, in Warriors of the Steppe, um, focuses on the nomadic steppe cultures and their uh, peculiar method of war. Um, their environment and way of life was the key to their success against settled civilizations. Uh, the predominant method of war in the West was, uh, was shock combat. Uh, this style of war proved futile because steppe warriors avoided direct confrontations. Rather, they employed thinned retreats with great effect and were able to shoot arrow arrows with pinpoint accuracy from horseback. So the steppe warriors picked off their enemies from afar and, uh, and neutralized the knight without having the face the fury of a charge. So furthermore, uh, the steppe cultures like the Mongols um, assimilated and recruited conquered nations with East. And this organization uh, possessed unmatched mobility, covering vast distances quickly. Uh, they were natural horsemen who cultivated the art of war from atop their mounds. So uh, they were a tough, resilient people who, like the Western Knight, uh, faded from history with the arrival of new technology that made uh, the step warrior ab obsolete. Other than that, uh, the step is the responsible of the formation of one of the world's biggest countries, Russia. Uh, the step dominated civilizations that they've come through with, and this primarily primarily because um, of the fact that they were experts of course uh, just like i mentioned earlier that uh, they were expert in horse archers uh, they were able to ravage and decimate uh, their enemy due to their ability to form into large confederations and they were often quite fearless and oh, sorry fearless and they didn't fear death so these people expand as far west as russia and east as far as modern day China and they live in the region of the world known as Eurasian Steep. So also in Eurasian Steep. So the Eurasian Steep is extremely flat and it makes it perfect for people riding on the horses to travel vast distances. Let's move on to the Hans and Yusingnos. Yusingnos are also known as Xiongno, uh, was a nomadic pastoral people who at the end of the 3rd century BCE formed a great tribal league that was able to dominate much of Central Asia for more than 500 years. Um, Central Asia comprises the countries of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, China's wars against the Xiongno, who were a constant threat to the country's northern frontier throughout this period, led to the Chinese exploration and conquest of much of Central Asia. The Xiongno first appear in Chinese historical records about the 5th century BCE, uh, when their repeated uh, invasions prompted the small kingdom of North China to begin erecting what later became the Great Wall. So, Great Wall of China is one of the largest building construction projects uh, ever undertaken. So it actually consists of numerous walls uh, that we can uh, see uh, circling around in the internet. Going back, so the Xiongnu beca became a real threat to China after uh, they formed a far-flung tribal confederation. When we say a confederation, um, it's a union of people or bodies of people. When they um, 
formed the far-flung tribal confederation under a ruler known as the Chanyu, uh, the rough equivalent of the Chinese emperor's designation as the Chanzi, which is known as the Son of Heaven. So when they ruled over a territory that extended from western Manchuria, which is the northeast province, provinces, to the Pamirs, that covered much of the present Siberia and Mongolia. So uh, these people were fierce mounted warriors who were able to muster as many as 300,000 horseback archers, just like in steppe people. Um, on their periodic intrusions into North China, uh, and they were more than a match for the much less maneuver uh, chariots of the Chinese. So the completion of the Great Wall along the wall hall of China's northern frontier during the Qin Dynasty, um, it slowed but it did not stop the Shangnu because uh, during the early Han Dynasty, rulers attempted to control them by marrying their leaders to Chinese princesses. Um, it was often adapted when... Um, uh, the ruling family uh, marrying princesses or let's say Chinese monarch marrying princesses uh, because they, it is a sort of strategy uh, with an enemy uh, state that was too powerful to defeat on the battlefield so in order to make strong bonds yeah that's uh, that's uh, mostly the reason why they wanted to uh, marry marry princesses furthermore in 51 bce the xiongno empire split into two bands first uh, in the eastern horde which submitted to the chinese and the western horde which was driven into central asia uh, the chinese expedition against the former group in the first century c again resulted in the temporary extension of chinese control too much of what constitutes the present-day northwestern provinces of Gansu and Shenzhen. But uh, the, as the Han Dynasty began to weaken, the Chinese began to hire Xiongnu generals to patrol China's northern borders, and this Semenesized tribesmen frequently torn their masters, particularly after the fall of the Han and the establishment of a number of small dynasties. I believe the reason why um, Xiongnu generals were hired, just like in step, they consist numerous archers who use bow and arrows during a fight while they are riding a horse. Imagine uh, 300,000 horseback archers. It's huge, right? And can ravagely and decimate opponents in just a blink of an eye. So yeah, that's how they work. Xiongnu raids continued periodically in the subsequent period, but all references to the tribe disappear after the 5th century. The no dominant nomad people in the Mongolian steppe in the 7th century, the Tuje, were identified with the Turks and claimed to be descended from the Xiongnu. A number of Xiongnu customs do suggest Turkish affinity, which has led some historians to suggest that the Western Xiongnu may have been the ancestors of the European Turks of later centuries. Others believe that the Xiongnu are the Huns who invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th, in 5th century, which we will um, discuss later on. Going back, though possible this view cannot be substantiated, the graves of several Chanyu or Xiongnu ships excavated in the Selinga River uh, in, sounder, in southern Siberia have found to contain remains of Chinese, Iranian, sorry, Iranian and Greek textiles indicating a wide trade between the Xiongnu and the distance people. Let's move on to Huns. So the Huns were nomadic warriors who terrorized much of Europe and the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries AD. They were impressive horsemen best known for their outstanding military achievements. The earliest systematic description of the Huns is that given by the historian Amanius Marcellinus 
Uh, they were apparently primitive pastoralists who knew nothing of agriculture. They had no settled homes, no kings. Each group was led by primates, as Amenius called them. Whether or not they had a single overall leader in 14th or 4th century is still a matter of dispute. As warriors, the Huns inspired almost unparalleled fear throughout Europe. They were amazingly accurate mounted archers and their complete command of horsemanship. Their ferocious charges and unpredictable retreats and the speed of their strategical movements bought them overwhelming victories. For half a century after the overthrow of the Visigoths, the Huns extended their power over many of the Germanic peoples of Central Europe and fought for the Romans. Uh, the various groups of Huns had been centralized under a king, Roa or Rogila. When Roa died in 434, he was succeeded by his two nephews, Blida and Atella. The joint rulers negotiated a peace treaty at Margos. Uh, it is now Pazarivak, Serbia, with Eastern Roman Empire, by which the Romans agreed to double the subsi subsidies they had been paying the Huns. The Romans apparently did not pay the sum stipulated in the treaty, and in 441, Attila launched a heavy assault on the Roman Danubian frontier, advancing almost to Constantinople. Uh, Constantinople, um, it was the capital of both the Byzantine Empire and the Ottoman Empire and the this Ottoman Empire will be um will be later on discussed with my um group mate which is um Michaela so you will hear um more about it but let's move uh, but let's um continue to where we left off as the war continued, uh, the Huns invaded Italy and sacked several cities. And that leads to the Eastern G Roman government thereupon closed the frontier to the Huns who ceased to play any significant part in history, gradually uh, disintegrating as a social and political unit. So the Hephthalites who invaded Iran and India in 5th and 6th centuries and the Xiongno, known earlier to the Chinese, are sometimes called uh, the Huns. But their relationship to the invaders of Europe is uncertain. So the half the lights um, are the people important in the history of India in Persia during the 5th and 6th century CE. So according to the Chinese chronicles, they were originally a tribe living to the north of the Great Wall and were known as the Hua or Huadon. Elsewhere, they uh, were called White Huns or Hunas. Uh, they had no cities or system of writing, lived in felt tents, and practiced polyandry. Um, in the 5th and 6th centuries, the Haftalites repeatedly invaded Persia and India. So in the mid 6th century, under the attacks of Turks, so they ceased to exit uh, as a separate people and were probably absorbed in the surrounding of population, but nothing is known of their language. That ends with my report, and if you have questions or doubts in mind, you can uh, directly message me or you can ask questions now. Um, and uh, we will be sending a PowerPoint presentation as well, and that way you will be guided. And um, that's uh, the information that is flashed in the screen is the reference uh, references where I um, get all the information that I've discussed earlier. Thank you.